topic is pornography. And Abuna David said, this is the biggest problem in the church. And I think Abuna Lazarus was hinting to it uh, without calling it what it is. It is such a devastating issue that affects homes all across, not just the Coptic church, but all over the world, every Christian church, every place. And so um, this is a little bit about protecting our kids in this internet generation. Um, famous guy, Albert Einstein, says, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. <laughs> now, that's so harsh. I don't think that we'll all be idiots, but the technology will definitely lead us to be prey. And every time I use this picture in a talk, it, it really reminds me. There's a wolf in sheep's clothing, which we are allowing so close to our homes that we have no idea that we've let the wolf on the inside. This quote, whoever captures the kids owns the future. Do you want to know who wrote that? A lesbian journalist. Like that's their agenda. Their goal is to capture not the adults, but it's to capture the kids at a very young age. That's the agenda that's being pushed around all over. So then the question is, what are we protecting our kids from? What is our goal and what is our focus? Privacy is a big deal. It doesn't take long before a kid grabs a phone and he posts a picture or an address or a phone number or something that's private. There's cyberbullying. Um, I think it was like 80% of contact within these chat rooms is to elicit sex from a minor. It's incredible. And I think this one is probably the most important thing, is exposure to pornography, violence, and adult content. So the question is, who really is raising our kids? Who is raising our kids? So let me ask you, do you know an average time, this is a survey, I, I've read this number on different websites, but this is for teens. Okay. So the average time a teen will spend on media and internet per day, average time for a teen. Well, how many of you have teens? There's probably like one couple, <laughs> two. So many of us have tweens, which are preteens, 11, 12 year olds, 10 year olds, and a lot of us are getting close to that. So it's better to be aware early than to uh, find out too late. So what is the average time a uh, teen will spend on media? How much? Four, six, four, six, twelve. Is it per week or day? Per day. What? If you look at how much they're on their phone, they say it's about nine hours per day. You know what is recommended for screen time per day? What is the recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics? Above the age of two, no more than two hours. Under the age of two, Zero. Zero. Now, I just want to know how many of us were able to make it here in the car <laughs> without three to four hours of screen time for the people in the back and possibly the passenger next to you? We ourselves are handing it to them for several hours, and that was, we didn't leave until 11 or 12. How many hours did we allow them just so that we could get, and you say, is it surprising? Well, the thing is, the study of uh, 8 to 18 year olds, and this was in 2010, this was way back, way, way back, so I would imagine these numbers are so outdated, but the people were engaging in media multitasking, our kids are so efficient now, that they don't just look at one thing, but now they can filter 10 hours of media into 7 and a half hours of their day. We're raising geniuses, right? They can look at phones and TV and listen to music all at the same time. So you say, oh, come on, nine, ten hours a day? No, they can do it in seven and a half. Or maybe they're doing it in three hours and they're getting six a day. This other one, 
I think this is awesome. This is what our parents would not have allowed this at all. But 263 middle school, high school, university students found that students studied for fewer than six minutes before switching to another technological distraction. Six minutes. They were saying, wow, six would be great. <laughs> So, another study found that one-third of all participating parents in the study, they're struggling to limit their children's use of media and technology. I mean, have you ever asked your kid to turn off the TV and they didn't listen? How many of the kids have their own iPads? How many of us, have, our kids have our, their own iPad? So, we have, how many, so, a lot of us have an iPad just for the kids. It's theirs. Okay. So then when we take that away, it's a struggle. But we've given it to them and said, but I want you to really not enjoy it more than I want you to. Yeah, right. Okay, so listen. 32% of children felt unimportant when their parents were distracted by their phones. They felt unimportant because what we were doing with our screens. What we do really affects them as well. And they learn that behavior. Like before they get the cell phones, um, how many of your kids have asked you for a cell phone because they see that it's so important to you? Say, I can't wait to get a cell phone because then I can look at Facebook and I can look at all these interesting YouTube videos and stuff like that. So are the kids really addicted to media? One out of two teens feels addicted. 50% of the kids, they, they, if you ask them, they say, oh yeah, I'm addicted. And the majority of parents feel that their kids are addicted. <coughs> Frequency. How much they need to feel to respond to text? 72% feel they need to do it immediately. That was kids. Same thing with parents. And the amount that have to check their devices every hour. How many of us would come to a family retreat without our devices? Distractions. 77% of parents feel their children get distracted by their devices and don't pay attention when they're together at least a few times a week. Do you want to know what they said? Uh, I have another uh, slide on another presentation. The average time a parent will <coughs> bless you, have meaningful conversation with their kids per week. Meaningful conversation parents with their kids per week. Your average time? 3.5 minutes. And think about it. You're talking to them while they're looking or you're looking or there's a TV on or something or we're yelling and it's, it's passive. It's when you can talk to them when they're not distracted and you're not distracted. If you remove all the distractions from everyone, there's about four minutes in a day. <laughs> all right. And a number of parents are fighting with their kids about it. So, this I thought was very interesting. Teens who see sex on TV are more likely to engage in premarital sex. It's just a statistic. And we, we say PG-13, it's okay, right? Because they're 14 or 15. But if they see it, usually on TV, it doesn't look painful. There's no emotional distress. It looks enjoyable. So why would they not engage? So, question. How do you decide what to let your kids watch on TV and movies? So this is like the question part. Now the answer. Watch it first. So that way we could spend twice as much time watching them. <laughs> so that's a good point. Don't let the, you know, a new movie came out and you haven't been there, you haven't seen it, you don't know what's going to be on there. So there has to be a way to help us know, should we allow them to watch this movie? Christian Critics. Okay. Yeah, yeah what is it called? Christian Critics Movie Guide. Um, you just look it up and I'll tell you every scene that is questionable, how many times they said this word. So yeah, it's common sense media and plugged in. You can have, I have an app on my phone, one is called Common Sense Media, and one is called Plugged In. And this is 
This is what it'll look like. You can narrow the results by age. It'll be, I just looked up like movies that are coming out. And it'll tell you this one is 13 plus. But when you click on it, it'll tell you there's three minutes of, you know, sexual activity. Four, and they use bad words. There's violence, this and that. So you can find out the next Disney movie, whether it'll have things that are appropriate for your kids. But that is, okay, how common is that? The question is, do you have standard rules about TV in your house? If there, the to talk about, if you don't have a set of rules for TV, they get addicted so quickly. Not only as kids, but they're so much more prone to being addicted when they're older. Just, it doesn't, they don't have to be good rules. They just have to be rules. So do we have specific rules? So the question was, what are the boundaries that we could set for TV? What are the boundaries? I think I was talking to Peter earlier about watching TV last night. He's like, oh, you were able to watch some TV with the kids? I said, yeah, but, you know, I happened to be scrolling through and I saw a cartoon. Um, but he's like, yeah, I know that it's, it's not a good idea. I usually don't, you know, watch because you never know what's going to come up. And I said about the safest thing you could watch with the kids at this point is a Food Network or, you know, Chop. Maybe. And maybe. maybe. And then yeah. commercials come on, and you never know what you're going to see there. So I think pretty much what Claudio said and, and what you said, even the Food Network, they say a lot of bad words when they talk about the, like on the side, or they, they bleep out some bad words, but they don't bleep out a lot. And if you'll notice, on a lot of them, almost every one of those, like where they have a group of people, there's almost always a homosexual or whatever, and they're saying, oh, me and my partner, and then all of a sudden, and they're the funny person. They put them on the show because they're the funny person. All of a sudden, our kids are looking at that, and it's like, yeah. so one thing, yes, Mary? Um, I don't know if, I'm, if this is right or not, and this is like a more of a question than a comment. So my kids are extremely, extremely, extremely sheltered. They go to a Catholic school. I'm a teacher at the Catholic school. They're with me literally 24-7. So, and I, I yes, know that. Yes, in your break, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I feel, especially Anthony, he's at an age where he needs to know a little bit more about the real world, but under my supervision. So, to, sometimes I use those scenarios and I make sure I'm watching with him so that I can, like, as a way to bring it up to. So those are some things we're going to discuss. I have some, like, what about when they do see something, what you should say. Um, so there are things, like, when is, one of the big things, like, you say, okay, I can watch a basketball game with my kids. I can watch a Super Bowl with my kids, right? Oh, <laughs> not during commercials. So if you are going to watch something that seems safe, pre-record it. Every home has a DVR. And I know you have to erase the 80, 90 hours of things that the wives have already recorded, right? <laughs> Just kidding. No, but so pre-record and you have to fast forward. And now it's not guaranteed that you'll skip everything, but you do have to, don't watch the game live because those commercials are terrible. Carl's Jr. has horrible commercials, but I love their burgers. <laughs> Okay, so here's, here's something, I just Googled this. Instead of TV, I just wrote 101 things to do instead of watch TV. Do you know how many websites that I came up with that have their own 101 things to do? They're not the same. There are so many things to do. So, read a page, walk around the neighborhood, journal, make a smoothie that's yummy, get rid of something. That would be awesome. Uh, make something from a Pinterest board, bake something from a Pinterest board, call someone, send a note, take a picture, plan a party, join a group, do an act of kindness, or house of prayer. There's 84 more on this one list. One of the Christian websites is talking about, there's actually a week where they have a screen-free week. It's like a national... April 24th, uh, you know, where it's a screen-free week. 
How many of us think there would be rebellion in our house if we did one week of screen free? I'll tell you one of the happiest times in our homes when we switched when we moved to a new home, and it took like a few weeks for the cable company to come out, and the TV wasn't working. It was great. It was great. We should always set rules like no TV during dinner. That's a great one because it allows you to communicate to each other how horrible is it when we're all watching and so we can't even like, the reason why there's 3.5 minutes is because we're all allowing ourselves to be distracted. All right, so did you know that 67% of three to nine year olds are online? And we're Egyptians, so our kids are smart, so that's probably higher. 35% are reported have gone to pornography sites. I was just talking to a friend last week. How many of your kids like Minecraft? Minecraft is a famous video game. It's like the biggest video game, right? So her son, the Minecraft necessarily isn't bad, but he was looking up a YouTube video on how to be some character in Minecraft or something about the game. And a bad video came up. Interesting, in Michigan, they were teaching internet to newcomers from Egypt. So it was around Christmas time, so they were just doing an internet search, showing them how to use the internet. So they typed in a very harmless word, toys. And the types of toys that came up were not the kind you see at Toys R Us. Could you imagine how many of your three to nine year olds would be interested in looking up toys on the internet? Very easy word for them to spell. And what if they saw those toys? How many of us are allowing our kids? So 19,000 parents, a global survey said yes, six-year-old kids are accessing pornography. So our kids are connected. 37% of three to four-year-olds and 87% of six to seven-year-olds are using their parents' tablets and smartphones. And what are they using them for? Netflix, YouTube videos, and is it easy for them to navigate away from that? from the kids section. Absolutely, absolutely. So are our kids immune or too young to see pornography? I mean, how many of you have kids between, that are under five? Okay, so most of us have kids that are under five. How many of you think they're immune to pornography? So, I mean, five years old, but come on. What about five to 10? How many of you think five to 10 is probably not going to access pornography. How do you think five to ten will not access pornography? Purposely? Just will not be that they're immune from pornography. They're not immune. So uh, this statistic always gets me. Ninety-one percent for first-time exposure by a teen was accidental during activities such as homework. So if you have a teen, there is a 9 out of 10 chance that they're going to come across pornography accidentally. But what's even more interesting is that 90% of 18 to 16 year olds have viewed pornography. 90%. Now see, they're not necessarily searching for pornography, but pornography is searching for them. Because they're trying to capture our kids because this is a huge money making industry. If you were a male in America in the last 20 years, then you've probably been exposed, right? I mean, if you grew up in America as a male, you've probably been exposed to pornography. And I'd say, I'm not gonna ask men to raise their hands, I'll just say 100% of us have been exposed to pornography as a male in America. It just, that's just how it is. And that was in a time where it was not easy to be exposed. But what about now? One of the youth was telling me this at a retreat, I don't know, probably seven, eight years ago. Back when our, we were young, none of us had the courage to go get a magazine. I'll tell you, my first time I was exposed, I went to spend the night at a friend's house in eighth grade, and he didn't get the magazine himself. His older cousin did. And of course, he had to hide it in his room, and then I got to see it. I was 13. But that was when it was hard to obtain. But now it's on your phone, and the youth was saying, I can't get away from it. It follows me wherever I go. There is no kid that knows how to use a cell phone that does not know how to access pornography. 
It is the easiest thing to do. And you know what? Their friends are teaching them how to do it. So, average age of internet exposure to pornography. Do you know when the average age of exposure to pornography, the first exposure, the average age? Choose an age. Seven. Eight. Six. Ten. The average is eight to nine. So that means there's definitely some older and some younger. That's third grade. Third to fourth grade is the average age of exposure. And this is why Steve Jobs didn't even let his kids use iPads. So the question is, not if your kids see pornography, but when they see pornography, will they be prepared? Let's say it's going to happen. What are you, I mean, what an innocent looking kid. What an innocent looking kid. But it, that first exposure, and they say that no matter how old you are, or how long that, though that first exposure was, you never forget it. I was talking to someone recently, just this week, and said, oh yeah, that first exposure, it sticks in your mind. It's imprinted. So, what should you do when a picture of a partially nude image comes on the TV? Okay, but they've seen the picture. Which, turn it off is fine. You can't let it go, you have to say something. You have to engage them, right? So then what do you do? Well, I have a question, because what if they're young enough that they didn't realize what it was? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. What if they didn't realize that there's something bad about it? Absolutely. I agree. And you don't know exactly when they know and when they don't know. Um, so when they see a partially nude picture, oftentimes they're not usually people that are <coughs> largely overweight with wrinkles and not attractive. So it's usually a very attractive person. So what does that do to a female who sees that on TV? What does it do to their self-image? Say, oh, I'm not that person. So what is an important thing to say to a girl who sees that? Say, what should you say? God created you beautiful. God, you don't have to be like that, but God made you beautiful. Let them realize that they are beautiful because God made them that way from a very early age. Turn away yourself. Mimic the behavior you want them to develop. If you see some, oh, don't look, don't look. I'll tell you when to look, I'll tell you when to look. Oh, okay, all right, now you can look. Wrong, wrong. Tell them that you think it's dangerous for you too. That it's dangerous for you so that we mimic the behavior. I don't wanna look and I don't think you should look. If it's not good for mom and dad, then clearly, and they're stronger than I am. Yes, sir. I wish I could make a rule and say, I will not allow myself to watch anything that my kids cannot watch. I mean, that, that should be a rule. And I, I've heard this from people that are not within the Orthodox Church, and I say, wow, these are good people that do it. Yes, I was raised on TV. 
You know, I was, you know, we watched TV for hours a day before we did homework. I know that doesn't sound Egyptian household, but that we got to do that. <laughs> and so TV is so much a part of me that that is a very admirable thing. And I wish I could get rid of TV. And I, I would say that is a goal. The kids, so I read this article on Facebook. I don't have Facebook anymore, so just, you know. Um, but it was a great study. It was about kids. They did a study about 75 junior high kids. It was an eight-hour day, and they were saying, you're not allowed to have any electronics. For eight hours, it was just a test to see what they could do. They all had their own room. They could sleep. They could do whatever. The comments were, they tried to sleep. They couldn't sleep. They were nauseous. Some of them were vomiting. They felt very ill. Going to withdrawals. Of the 75, only three made it to the end. Only three. One of them said, I felt nauseous. It was the most difficult thing I've ever done. Another one said it was very difficult. Only one kid said, oh yeah, no problem. And that kid was playing and doing other things and being creative. He wasn't sleeping. Like That kid who was okay to be without it was doing productive things. When you put away the TV, the amount of productivity in your household escalates. Where they are cleaning up their room or they are doing a project, they're using their mind, those are actually some of the most successful people. And so we have an opportunity to build character, to build, you know, like strength. When we say no TV or 30 minutes a day or whatever, let's do something. I know this is hard. Let's do something together. I know you and the kids, maybe a game, maybe a project where you're else. You know what? They will love to do something with you. And I, I mean, I've seen my kids so many times. Can you turn off the TV? Can you turn off the TV? Can you go get dressed? Can you go get dressed? Can you go get dressed? One, two, nine, ten, go. You've done it, right? How do you want to say something? Well, it, it was just a, a question, because I think I'm I think I'm in a similar boat where since my kids have been born and we haven't had cable TV, um, and, and there's pros to that, right? There's less chance for exposure, but at the same time, are we losing an opportunity to teach them about things that they will be exposed to at some point, right? Because now, at some point, they're gonna move out and they're gonna be exposed to it. They're gonna be, see they're gonna be seeing it. And I won't have had that opportunity to have those discussions because frankly, it just doesn't, a lot of that doesn't exist. See, that's what I was saying. Like, I'm starting to use certain shows that are very kid-friendly, but it has a few issues that come up to try and bring it up. Even like, I mean, uh, we've been watching America's Got Talent and they have someone who's transgender. Well, I did take that opportunity to explain to the kids that this is completely not godlike and this is not what we do, but they are now aware of it under my supervision, not from the outside world. The most important thing to do is to engage them in conversation for everything that they see. Now, it's better for you to teach them than for Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so you say, oh, my kids, they didn't get to see, thank God. <laughs> and if you want to be the one that teaches them, go ahead. So you're going to say something. No, I'm just, I, uh, I mean, I, I know this whole thing almost like uh, the immunization debate, where, I mean, the difference between immunization and full-blown disease that will kill you is how it's introduced and how it's controlled. If you completely segregate your children, you're really setting them up not only is it at some point they can move out of your house, but you know throughout the system there is a consistent message that, that is coming across that uh, never mind kind of accidental exposure and what have you, but the notion of all morality is relative, um, different lifestyles are equally valid. Uh, all of that is con constantly bombarded into their brains from a very very young age, and unless at home you are introducing these ideas and telling them, you know, this is how the children of God behave, this is how uh, we behave in this family, as opposed to outside. Uh, complete segregation and being overly harsh in what we see, so on and so forth, that, that basically sets them up for failure, not success. The, the, we have, I have some questions about the talk, and, I'll get, and it, it addresses that, Tom. I was just thinking, 
what would the Bible say about this? And I, this verse keeps coming to mind when Christ was praying with John. He was praying about his his people, and he said, "I did not wish that you remove them from this world, right?" So let's not do the same thing with our kids. Um, I don't know. We're not saying that the form of the internet is evil or that TV is evil, and there are ways to allow them to enjoy it, but absolutely, there there are also ways to do it and be regretful and say, oh man, I wish I didn't do that. It's better to be proactive than reactive, right? So I just want to read that quote about like, if, you, if they see someone partially nude, a lot of people out there want to make you believe you're worth less than others because you don't look a certain way or you aren't with someone who looks a certain way. That's a lie. Your body is God's creation. It is very good. And just the partially nude part. I mean, uh, in their freshman year at college, you're going to be exposed to that whether they want to or not. So oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> a, a speaker from Focus on the Family who was going to visit a Christian college and he was going to go give a talk, and so he wanted to do a survey before he got there. And the question was not, do you watch pornography, but have you seen pornography in the last week? That was, that was the question. Have you seen pornography in the last week? The response was, of males, 100%. <laughs> of females, it was 87%, and this was a Christian college. So it's definitely there. So then the question is, how do you prepare them from, so that's kind of what we're getting to. So what do you tell your kids if they see people kissing in a movie or on TV? They're married. They're married. They're married. <laughs> or ask them, <laughs> or ask them, are they, and if you teach them from their young, oh, they're kissing, are they married? If they say no, then say, why should they not be kissing? Because they're not married. At least let them respond, they're not married, so they should not be kissing. So they understand from a very young age, oh no, they're kissing, but they're not married, that's wrong. So as long as they learn, because we can't, all, like you said, sooner or later they're like, ah, but they're not married. Parents, should they be kissing? No, because they aren't married. So like that, that's the response that you want them to understand. So 25% of all internet searches from all people of all ages are for pornography. 25%. And if you aren't answering their questions about sex, Dr. Google will. So the key is that you have to discuss these things with them at a very early age. And they say, so what age is it recommended to have the talk with our kids? Should you wait till they ask the question? Or should you postpone if they ask questions? What if your kid is eight and they're asking you questions? You say, well, let, we'll talk about it when you're 11. If they're asking, it's probably time to start. Because if they're asking and you don't answer, they're going to find the answer from Joey or Christine or you know someone on the playground who has a brother or who's already taught them, an older brother. At, at what age? Fifth grade. Usually fifth grade. And so the question is, who do you want the first person to be talking to your kids about sex? Who should be the first person? It should be you, because once they see that the good information is coming from you, that you are the trusted resource, and that you are willing to talk about it with them, then that is the best thing. And then once you discuss it with them, don't say, you tell them, don't discuss it with so-and-so or so-and-so. If you have any questions, come talk to me, because you're already willing to do that, but you've already been doing it. So you actually should start teaching at a young age, from three to five, and someone said, you talk to them about body parts. It was interesting, I was at the conference, pornography conference, and one person who was telling, talking about his five-year-old kid, he said, do you know the difference between boys and girls? He says, oh yeah, dad, I do. Said, oh, you do? Really? He's like, well, what do you know? He's like, boys have a penis, and girls have an agenda. <laughs> and I thought, wow, like it took me 30 years to find this out, and this boy at the age of five, how, where did he hear it? On the playground, but... <laughs> I told you, 30 years. I, th these kids are advanced now, so listen. You should teach them arms, legs, teach them the correct terminology for body parts, and do it as normal. 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the, you know. <laughs> and tell them that these are certain parts we cover with our bathing suits and, you know. So from the earliest age, Josh McDowell, I don't know if you've heard of Josh McDowell, he's like an author of tons of books, apologetics. He's, I mean, he starts engaging his kids and grandkids. Oh, why does she have a baby? Oh, because God put that baby. Like, they're, they're already talking about, oh, because mom and dad love each other. And they, you know, like, they're already learning that this is God's plan. And when they learn it from the right point of view, talking about gender identity. So when your boy climbs a tree, God gave you an adventurous, you know, spirit of a boy. Oh, God created you a beautiful princess. Let, when they do something that's a girl thing, praise them for them to understand they are God's created them as a girl, and God created them as a boy, so there's no confusion about their identity. There should be no confusion about their gender identity because you've instilled it in them from a very young age. What if your girl is, likes to do tomboy things, your boy is, you know, like, you know. That's absolutely right. I was talking to a pediatrician, and she was talking about the whole gender identity thing and how now it's being pushed on to kids, and you guys, I don't know if you've heard, but it's children now taking hormone treatment. She was saying it's so common for little girls to sometimes be, do boy things and little boys to do little girls things. And obviously that's not the norm, but if they're doing it all the time, that's not normal. But she's saying it's so common. Yeah, it, so it is very normalize it, but yeah. at the same time push them to But worse. when they do do something very, you know, exactly. obviously have them. So from a very early age, you should start, they should know the body parts, they should know the difference between boys and girls, and then they should know the difference. So this one lady, I, I read a book called Guardians of Purity. She works with folks in the family. It's a, it's a really nice book. Um, she actually reads books to them at their different ages, so that includes these topics. So it's just like a normal book. They're reading about some octopus, and they're reading about, you know, like, where babies come from. It's like all part of it, so it's like, it's normal, it's natural, it's part of the conversation, and there's no concern. So that by the time they're asking the questions, they already know a fair amount, and they've learned it from you, and it's normal, it's not like this creepy topic, oh my gosh, can I talk to mom or dad about it? I have a question. Yes. I, I know, I, I, my kids are growing up. Mira's like figured everything out. <laughs> 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 I have a boy who likes to play with dolls. Is there a boy that likes to play with dolls? If there is one that likes to play with dolls, should the parents tell him, no, this is for girls only, or they should him should let him play with it? I don't have boys. Huh? I don't have boys. Does anyone else want to You don't have a boy. Or the vice versa. If the girl wants to do things like a boy, that like, you call a tomboy, what yeah, do you do with her? It, it's not wrong to be so... The book I was reading, it talks specifically about a tomboy, a girl that was, she wanted to be competitive and beat all the boys in sports, and they found out why. The girl, why she wanted to be like the boys and be, because she felt that boys were better. And so she wanted to be like the boys because she, in her mind, felt like God made boys better. So she had a wrong understanding that God made girls wonderful as well. It's going around here. Uh, so we have to understand the idea that why they might be doing those things. If, you know, like there's a reason, like if there's a problem with them understanding their gender, then let the, you have to find out why they're doing these things as opposed to just cutting everything off. The most important thing in all the conferences they say is open communication, not browbeating, not like, you know, they say, you know, if your kid, you know, sees pornography, don't let your eyes pop out and start yelling from the top of your lungs. Like they said, that doesn't help. So there's a, there's a reason to you discuss calmly and be the mature, responsible person they feel comfortable with. And get them, you know, like super what, what do you do to, what do you tell the boy who play, play with dog? Until he's like six years old. I mean, there are lots of It's okay. Like, it depends on the age. That's what I was going to say. Like, at a very young age, they're, they're exploring. And even up to six, it's, it's not that, of course, it depends on how much <laughs> and, and how deep. And like Mark said, that the reasoning was. But uh, if, it, if he's 13, then it's a problem. <laughs> also, I, I think another important thing, when they, just like Mark was saying, when they, uh, when they do certain things that, let's say, he does more boy activities, you really praise him because a lot of times kids will do something so they can get attention from the parents, even if it's negative attention. 
So sometimes he might be playing because he knows this is when mom or dad or whoever will come to him and say, no, you shouldn't do that. And he's getting the attention. That's what is being filled. So, so sometimes when we pay no attention or make it kind of something silly and, you know, uh, but when he does something else, we really praise him and, and we really give him that attention. They'll want that more and, and maybe that's sometimes that's the need that they're looking for. So, so my, I, my daughter didn't know she was a girl until she was probably like five or six. She, she was, that's your fault. Yeah, <laughs> she, was raised, she was raised pretty much around boys. Our friends all had yeah. boys and, and um, so for the most part, she played with boys even when she played sports. She's a little tall for her age, they pair her up with boys. But I think- Her dad is the home. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think mom played a really big role teaching her about her femininity and, and, and giving her those ideas of being a girl. and So there is somewhat of a counterbalance that happens at home where now she's beginning to kind of fall into that, that role of self-identity. Actually, that, that's a great thing. And uh, you talk about the mom speaking to the girl. Right. Um, and they were, in the book, they spoke specifically about dad speaking to the girls as girls, praising them as for being girls. They say that Dads that are not as involved uh, with their goth girls are 250% more likely to engage in premarital sex. So the the wife, the husband of the wife who wrote the book, he heard this. So this was like, okay, my wife is writing this book. 250% he's like, so he makes regular planned time. Now he travels internationally because he does humanitarian service. So he he's not there all the time, but there's a expected time with the dad. So the moms are extremely important. The moms are always there. But there's a huge responsibility for the dads to engage your boys, to engage your girls as their gender. And they say, obviously, one of the great things that is for dads to date their daughters, for them to see what manners they are, respectful, and let them learn how they should be treated, and to be appreciated, not necessarily because of the way they physically look, but because they are God's creation and beautiful and then they all of a sudden have this self-esteem. They're not looking for that love from other guys who might treat them. Uh, so talk to your kids about appropriate and inappropriate touch. Don't let that be something that you discover later. Yes, Mary? So speaking about the subject of the dad talking to you, um, how much of that should happen? In other words, should the dad be talking about sex? Should be talking about here's the difference between the boys and the girls? What is the dad position and speech? That's your responsibility if you have girls. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean. We have girls, I, I, I mean, I don't know where, where it, it, because you said earlier, we should be talking about it as if it's, this is the norm. Is that the mom? Like, no, I mean, there, the there, there's a certain level where dad can be involved, but then there's a, there's a certain age, you know, obviously the, the intimate details and their bodies changing and stuff. You know, Claudio may have some idea, but I imagine you have a much better idea. And so, you know, like, the, like the actual talk itself definitely should be done by the same gender. And so we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But The other question, yes. back to what you said earlier, what should you say if they are exposed to accident, accidentally? What is the appropriate... Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in just one minute. So this is about the talk itself. You want to ask a question? Just a question. What does that look like? It's called Guardians of Purity. I, I have like a zillion. She actually wrote a curriculum. Is it, are we done? There's, she actually wrote a curriculum about age-appropriate things to talk about with each age, which I'm thinking if we can buy the curriculum and somehow distribute it to, you know, make it available for parents to know what are the appropriate things to talk about your kids at each age. Um, you know, you don't want to explain everything at the age of five, but you don't want to wait till they're 13 or 14. You definitely want to do it before they hear that talk at school. So right, if, if they hear it in fifth grade, you want to be the first person that teaches them. Don't let it be anyone else. Um, and then, uh, so at 11 or 12, so it's important to talk about romance. What, you know, it's interesting, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend relationships are not as important anymore. Because now they can just have sex and there's no relationship. 
there is an app, Abuna Woolis, when we, he, we went to the conference together, he told me there's an app where, like for a school, the kids can choose a location where there's no teacher or whatever, and they can go in, meet, have sex, and leave. No talking, no nothing, and just, so it, everything is out there. So the whole, the idea of what romance, I mean, they need to learn the concept of a beautiful marriage and a family and God's plan from an early age. Those are things that we need to discuss with our teens and of course our bodies and, and then the idea of we shouldn't er entertain lustful thoughts. So what do you do if your child has seen porn? Well, how will you know if your child has seen porn? So Abuna said you have to ask them. I agree. Ask them. I don't know if any of us have asked our kids at the age of 9, 10, 11, have you seen it? Most of us would say, oh no, our kids, there's no way they would ask them. But in this book, she gives the example of a kid who, who saw it, and he, you know, he went to bed that night, and then his parents came and woke him up. You want to know how they knew? Because they have a filtering app that shows that their son has watched it. And they spoke to that kid that night, and he felt terrible about it. But he says, that discussion, my parents coming and talking to me about it that night, made all the difference in the world. I felt so free and clear. Because the most important thing, what oftentimes keeps this problem going, is that they keep it in secret. That they've seen it, they're kind of... You know, don't know what to do about it. They're confused, and they don't know, but they kind of liked it. So do I tell mom and dad? They might feel shame, and if they can't discuss it with you, what happens is they might see it again, and all of a sudden, they get trapped. So the filtering website, and the, it has the accountability portion. I'll talk about it in just a minute, Tom. So what if I ask, and the answer is, what is porn? Yeah, praise, we don't have to praise the word. question. Then they're how, would you, <laughs> how would you phrase the question to a 9 or 10 year old? Okay. Has anyone shown you pictures of, of naked people, of, of you know, naked females or males? Has anyone ever shown you pictures? Have you seen that on the internet? How did you feel about that? They need to know that that was inappropriate and that there were people. And so if you're having to talk with them early enough, you, so there's a book that came out at the conference called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. And they're saying you should read this book, and I think a lot of the priests ordered it for their churches, but you should read this book to your kids starting at the age of five or six. There are good pictures and there are bad pictures. Let them know from when they're young, there are good pictures and there are bad pictures, and when you see it, they need to recognize that's a bad picture, and they have to leave it. They have to, they have to turn away from it. So they say if your kid on the computer sees it, Obviously, turn off the computer. Why? Let's say they run, they go tell mom, and five-year-old brother comes and sees the screen. Turn off the computer, right? They need to tell you right away. And so these are things that don't wait till they've seen it and then expect them to come to you. Talk to them about it now. From the end of this retreat, for those of you who have kids at that age, I would say from anywhere from eight to above, let them know that if anyone shows you a bad picture or you happen to see a bad picture on the internet or whatever, Come talk to me, okay? Because you need to know who showed it to them. Did they see it at school with someone, you know, like one of the neighbors, someone on their team? Like, you need to know so that you can prevent it from continuing to happen. But you need to know how they process it. How do they feel about it? And say, you know, God, that's why when we wear, wear bathing suits, like when you tell your little kids, no one should see the parts that are covered by our bathing suits. So get the bathing suits that cover their bodies. <laughs> that just, you know... <laughs> Um, and you wear the same coat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but don't, so one thing is don't overreact and make them feel horrible that they never share anything with you again. They need to, huh? <laughs> yeah. Same gender guy. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you need to have that talk with them very early about bad pictures. Don't wait for them to discover on their own. Sexting, I'm almost done here, so we can stop whenever. Um, did you know that 40% of all teenagers have posted or sent sexually suggestive images? 40%, two out of five have sent or received. Teenage girls have a few reasons why they do this. 40% do it as a joke. As a joke, 
Really? Sending partially nude images of yourself is funny? Why they think that's funny is terrible. Um, some of them do it to feel sexy and 12% feel pressure to do it. Now boys are asking girls, send me an image of yourself before I decide for you to be my girlfriend. And so many girls, because of their low self-esteem, or they may themselves may not think they're pretty, or because the guy said, well, she's already sent me a picture, so I'm trying to decide. What? Do you know how many of them will do it? 40% of teenagers have posted, or, like, it's not a small number. It's not a small number, and are we protecting them? Who's going to see the text? 17% of them share the message. How many of you guys know about Snapchat? How many of you guys know what Snapchat is? So it's on a lot of phones, right? Or it's easy for them to get. Um, Snapchat is where you can send a picture to someone and supposedly it deletes in 10 seconds. So this is where a lot of them think, oh, I'm just saying to my boyfriend. And within 10 seconds, if the boy sees it, it's very easy to screen save. So we can screen save in two seconds, right? So I mean, and you, there's times where like to get back at an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, it gets posted. It's actually, it's against the law. It's considered, you know, child pornography if you repost it. So like, if your kids are receipt, like it's just horrible. All kinds. Of, there were a number of kids in Florida or whatever that were like persecuted as major felons, and they were like teenagers because they reposted like one girl's, you know, and usually it was like a girl posted another girl's to embarrass her. And there's all kinds of like horrible, shameful things that happen. It's just a horrible thing. Sexting is no joke. Um, so, if we have rules for TV, should we have rules for cell phones? What, what kind of what kind of rules? <laughs> yeah. Actually, it should be too heavy to carry. <laughs> Stuff. <laughs> so what kind of kid, what kind of, I mean our kids are going to ask for them, maybe our kids are not there yet, but what are the rules that they should have? We did a contract, like a written contract that we found off a lot of A cell phone contract. Do not allow your kids to have a cell phone without them signing a contract. And you yourself should set certain rules. Obviously, no phone at the table, no phone in their room at night. So, like at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., there's no phone in their room. They're not allowed to have it because if they access it, what are the chances you're going to know what they're accessing? There's no reason it should be used like in front of you. I will never post anything that embarrasses me, my family. I will not disclose, disclose all this. Like, it's just a great thing. Yes? Why can't you just take the phone all away? Why do the kids need even a phone? I mean, at certain, you're right, and so, so one of the things is like, this phone is meant to be a point of communication between my parents and I. That's it. <laughs> like, so the flip phone, so it all depends on the purpose of it. If the purpose is to have access to Facebook and internet, you're setting them up for a disaster. If it is for a form of communication for their safety, it's not a terrible thing. So there, that, that's an important thing, and we have to find out why is it that you, what is it that you're looking for? If it's that freedom to explore, that's dangerous. You need to know who their contacts are on that sexting. There's so many, I can't remember what percentage, are sending these to people they've met on the internet but they've never met face to face. Like complete strangers, like almost like 55% of sexts are sent to people they've never even met. So like you have, the, the cell phone, you have all rights to look at all their contacts at all times. Like it's your phone, it's not theirs. You pay for it, like it's your phone. So it's not an, a, a, it's not an entitlement, it's a privilege. Yes, Mary. What is the statistics in the Coptic Orthodox Church of uh, these numbers? Oh, we never do it. What? <laughs> what? We, we don't do it out of fear of depression of congregations. No, what's the same? It's almost the same. It's almost the same. Would be the same? Absolutely. I, I would say it's probably almost the same. Just because they're popular doesn't mean they're immune. Well, I don't know that. If you ask, Mary, I hope not. Mary, <laughs> I'd love to say our numbers are lower, but even if they're lower, they're not zero. Okay. So, and if you ask the priests in their confessions, they're blown away because we didn't deal with this much when we were young. Abuna David said, this is the biggest problem in the church, which is pornography. The biggest problem. You have more than four confessors? 
<laughs> right? Like, every priest, when we, we spoke to the priest at the priest convention, uh, you know, the monthly priest meeting, me and Winnebos, we spoke to them, all of them said, this is a huge problem in our church. We gave a talk, like, can you come give a talk at our church? Can you come? Because everyone is dealing with it. So the problem is way bigger than you think. Just realize it's way bigger than you think. Don't ever think your kids are immune. Be proactive, be connective to your parents. I'm just, I think it's the last slide. So how do we develop models for purity? <clears throat> Number one, obedience to parents. So they were saying, if your kids, when you tell them something and they don't listen to you, if you constantly, like you tell your kid and they're just not listening to you, you're setting them up for, they don't have to listen when dad says, don't look at this, don't do that. They need to learn obedience to their parents from a young age. Because if they don't learn obedience to their parents, obedience to God is way behind. So if your kids are rebellious now, you need to correct that behavior before it comes time for the age where they can actually do all these things on their own. So obedience is key. So don't let your kids learn to be entitled. It says one of the most important words for your kids to learn is, is no. No. They need to learn... Um, well, they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what do you say is? They don't know. The, the modesty of their attire. I mean, little kids' clothes, little girls' clothes, they have the cutest clothes at the age of three and four and five. But if their bathing suits when they're three, four, and five are way too revealing, when they're six, seven, eight, they're going to say, why, why am I not allowed to wear this? I've been wearing my whole life. And then it becomes an argument. The way they should dress for church Okay, you need to cover your shoulders. You need to have the length of... Let it be a rule from now. Oh, we are going to cover our knees for the rest of our lives. <laughs> okay? They say if they learn that when they're young... Men, cover your knees. No one needs to see your knees. But if they learn that from a young age, they won't argue with it when it comes... But if your first conversation is when they're in high school, it's terrible. Discipline. If your kids are not self-disciplined, this idea of delayed gratification is so key. Because when it comes to the time of temptation, which are not rare, they're out there all the time. If your kids don't have this idea of, I don't need to do this now, or yes, I will get you this, but in one week, your birthday is not for six months, we're not getting it one day before, like, they need to know I can wait for certain things, especially when it comes to marriage, right? I can wait for certain things I don't need, because if they're not disciplined and they want something and they get it now, when they want something, they're going to get it then. So obedience, discipline, modesty in clothing, manners around others. They should know how boys treat girls. And how girls should be treated by boys and how so that they don't accept certain behaviors. Boys need to know that you don't just treat a girl a certain way and they're not just and they're not objects and you can't just like they need to be respected and honored and revered. Those are incredible things that you could teach your kids. They need to learn that. Standing against the tide. At some time, at some point in time, we have to tell them. It's okay to not do what everyone else is doing. Be the leader. Don't be the follower. And the last thing is be the model yourself. Be the model yourself. Be disciplined with your phones, with your TV, with what we see. Now, the last thing, the last, last thing I'm going to say is this. Every single home should have an internet filter device. Every single home. And what do I mean by that? There are different programs out there. One of them that they spoke about at the conference a lot was Covenant Eyes. A lot of these like purity websites, they all have contracts with Covenant Eyes. There are lots of filter things. Something that's free is OpenDNS, right? It goes on your modem, right? So OpenDNS, it's a free thing, and it'll protect the internet in your house. 
but I was just speaking to an IT guy and it's like it really slows your internet down. So it was painful. So a lot of people don't like it and they get rid of it. So Covenant is one of them, there's lots of them, but Covenant Eyes, what it does is it can also go on your devices and it, you have to download the specific internet search engine or whatever and you use specific one and that will be, um, but then it gives you accountability reports and allows you to set the level of filtering for by age. So like if you want to set it for a five year old, then they're not allowed to see something more. A 10 year old, a 12 year old, a 17 year old. And then if they should see something, you can set up who gets a report. It could be the priest, it could be the parent, or for the husband, it could be the spouse, for the wife, it could be the husband. It could be something they say, just filtering is not enough. They say the accountability portion is critical. It's critical. This is how we get corrected. This is why like, when we go to confession, like if a Buddha doesn't know about it, like, okay, good. But once he knows, like, okay, I gotta deal with this. I don't wanna have to tell a Buddha again. Same thing. When they know that you're gonna know what they're doing, they're less likely to do it. So my dream is this, is that every household in not just HTC, but the Coptic Church all over Southern California, this is what we want all the priests to do, covenanteyes.org. It doesn't have to be that one. It's $15 a month, which is a very small portion of what we pay for our internet and our cable service. $15 a month, and some websites you can get like first month free or whatever, but I don't think that's a big deal for any of us because we're all here, we can all afford this. But it will see. So if you ask yourself, building a whole life of purity, how many bad sexual experiences does it take to ruin a life? One. It takes one. And so the key is to repair them. You could be doing a lot, but if they have that one negative, so you need to be preact proactive and, and do this. Okay. So, a lot of people already have it. so, so Claudio has Claudio wants to show one something that they have, um, and you know, like I said, there's lots of them. But to not have a filter on your internet where your kids are using your iPads in your house or whatever, like there's no reason to set them up. You should be proactive, and honestly, it's helpful for parents as well. It's helpful for parents as well. Uh, not claiming that this is necessarily the best or perfect, there's probably shortcomings in, in what we use, but this is something to show you uh, because it's built into Windows. So if any of you guys have uh, Windows PCs, or I know it's not that common, but Windows phones, uh, it has a built-in monitoring system. So our daughters do have phones. They also have a laptop that they use for school. Uh, they have a, an account that they log into both. And it shows, uh, allows you to do all kinds of controls on it, including not letting them install any apps uh, without asking for, per for permission from me and then I can authorize it on a one by one basis. Um, it can track, uh, I don't know if you can see, but it'll track and show me everything that they've searched for, every image that they've looked at. I can look at every website that they've visited um, and I can expand any one of these. I can say, well, what does it mean, google.com? And I can go through and, and see exactly what they're able to list. It actually sends me weekly emails of like their activity. Uh, you can set um, you know limits on apps and, and not just that, but also screen time. So you can have it automatically basically lock the device down at certain hours of the day or after a certain number of hours or minutes of use, uh, things like that. So I, I, there's probably other systems out there that may be uh, better. How do, you, how do you access this? Um, it's probably, if you're, if you're interested in how to access this, it's probably better than me taking the time right now because I wasn't prepared to talk about this. I could talk to you offline and, and show you how I set it up, It's but it's part of Windows is there's no monthly fees or anything like that. And um, what about for a Mac? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, at, at the conference, even like Covenant Eyes, so they're saying Macs and iPhones, actually iPhones, they're, they're working on it, but like those are the hardest things for them to protect. And so they said more things are out there for droids and you know uh, Windows stuff like that than compared to Mac. Just something to think about for the future. But they're working on it because they know that Apple has a large percentage. But for those of us who have these things, there's no reason to that, and that's free, right? Mm -hmm.
So Microsoft.com, maybe we'll do a quick, you know, like workshop at church and everyone can bring their computers. We'll say we're going to announce it on this day and we'll, we'll figure out something for Mac computers as well. And the nice thing is that this also protects phones if you have a Droid. Windows phone. Windows phone. So it Which protects no one. It actually protects no one. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but, that, but that's exactly why we got them that Which phone. Which is why they got them. So those are all things that, if, if it does come to that point, it's better to get something that you can protect than to get them something in general. All right, so we probably have eliminated all break time, and now dinner, sorry about that. Thank you, thank you. I think we took advantage of the time.